Johannesburg, this is Tonight with Jane Dutton. Judge Yakub, who is an Indian himself, says 90% of Indians are racist. They never said they are taking him to court. Julius Malema comes and repeats after an Indian, no, you can't say the things that must be said by Indians only. This is about black people coming here demanding, keeping us so-called colored people, the actual Aboriginal people, out of work, out of school, arming our women, arming our children, the, in, the indigenous people of this province. Oh. A new and dangerous twist in the racism saga in South Africa. We look at what's behind the call to evict Eastern Cape black people from the Western Cape. What to do with racist Indians? In Checkpoint's new slot on Tonight with Jane Dutton, the focus is on the legal help required by some communities to ensure access to clean water without succumbing to the fatal E. coli virus. We also cross live to The Hague to examine South Africa's relationship with the International Criminal Court. Are we back in or do we stay out? Very good evening to you. Good to see you again. Now, before we tackle race, water, and international developments, with my guest, Shahan's going to tell us what stories are making the news. A lot about Barack Obama, obviously. Yeah, a lot. We're going to highlight that. And we're going to start with that, Jane. Thanks for that. Former U.S. President Barack Obama says inequality still persists despite strides made in fighting injustice. Obama delivered the 16th annual Nelson Mandela Lecture in Johannesburg today. It's his highest profile speech since leaving office. Obama's urging people around the world to respect humanity human rights that are under threat. Deny the very real strides that our world has made since that moment when Madiba took those steps out of confinement. We also have to recognize all the ways that the international order has fallen short of its promise. Well, Patco has been ordered to pay workers the wage increase agreed on with bus drivers in May. An almost month-long national strike earlier this year caused havoc. It ended with a two-year wage deal, but several other bus companies say they can't afford it and they have approached the bargaining council for exemptions. If Padco finds itself uh, tightly squeezed towards the end of the year, then they can come back and reapply again. But it's too early right now, so bonuses will be paid. We're really happy about that. And today, um, I wonder if you know, we're actually having a hearing for Golden Arrow. Uh, we've made submissions and we'll be making oral submissions today because Golden Arrow has also applied for an exemption. And the number of new HIV infections in South Africa is dropping. The Human Sciences Research Council has released a survey on HIV prevalence and sexual behavior. It polled over 33,000 people across the country. It's found the number of new infections has dropped by 44% since the last survey in 2012. It's estimated that nearly 7.9 million South Africans are living with the virus. All right, those are your headlines. Jane? Thank you very much for that, Shahar. Now, tonight, we take a look at racism in South Africa. Back under the spotlight, as if it ever went away. Racist Indians and a call to kick black people out of the Western Cape. And this time, it's not from Helen Zilla. And remember Vicky Momberg? Well, she was given a two-year jail term after using the K-word 48 times when a black police officer came to her help. In sentencing her, the magistrate said she wanted to send a serious message to society. Is jail the answer to tackling the wider social problem of racism and its causes, or is much more needed, I suspect so? Now, we're going to get into this with our guest, retired Constitutional Court Judge Zak Yakub. Now, you'd think he'd know better, but he too has been doling out some pretty racist comments focusing on Indians. I'm sure you've got a few thoughts on this, so do get in touch. Send us a tweet on hashtag tonight with Jane Dutton. You can also call us on 011-759-6340. Those details on your screen right now. Zach, a very good evening to you. Very good evening to you. Thank you for having me here. It's an absolute pleasure. Tell us why you made those comments. I made those Indian. comments because I was talking to Indian comrades in Karwastan about non-racism and developing non-racism. 
My approach always is that when you talk about things to people, we start with ourselves. And my approach has always been that everyone must work very hard within themselves to become non-racist and non-sexist. My own struggle towards becoming a non-racist and non-sexist was a hard one. From the time I was 20, I shouted non-racism, but my heart was truly racist for about 10 years, and I had to work very hard at myself to really begin to understand that everybody was human. And where was that racism aimed, That's, then and now? No, no, now it's not there at all for me. I'm fine now. I cured myself by the time I was 30 years old. But with many people I come across, and I said it about Indian people because I was talking to Indian people then to say we must try and get our community right. But my own feeling is that racism is actually everywhere. There's racism which is worldwide. In India, the North Indians, because they are brighter in color, think that they are better and they have more brains than the people in the south of India. In South Africa, you will find that the light-skinned, uh, straight-haired colored people think that they are a cut above the dark-skinned uh, uh, colored people who do not have straight hair, so-called colored people. In, 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 even amongst African people, there are a large number of racists who feel that, who have, who have negative feelings against Indian people and so on. So my, my view is that the racism is a world trouble. Are you shocked that people are shocked when you make such a, a statement that in your speech, when you said that 90% of Indians are racist? No, no, I said 90% of Indians I know are racist, <laughs> which is a bit different. I, I've conducted no survey, right? Right, okay, but were you shocked that people were no, shocked no, no, to hear that? No, no, because people will be very, very defensive. And most of the people who complain, I know some of the people who complain about what I've said, and they are the racists themselves. So actually, I can understand they're being defensive. I can understand they're not looking at themselves. I can understand they thinking that the real trouble is that when an Indian person says, we pulled ourselves up by our own bootstraps, we worked very hard and we are wonderful people, we believe in education and so on and so on, all those are racist comments aimed at demonstrating that we so-called Indians are superior to everyone else in the country. Okay, it, let me ask you this, yes. if I may. When you made those comments, there was obviously quite a bit of reaction, but not yes. as much reaction as when Julius Malema of the EFF made similar comments. What do you put that down to? Is I that I put that racism? down to the fact that while my comments were not racist, and my comments were aimed at developing non-racism in our society, making things positive, Julius Malema is an But do you think it was seen as not racist because you're Indian? It's seen as no, no, racist I, because you're black? I, 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 I think that I was not being racist. But what I'm I was just asking how it's been perceived. Do, uh, it may be perceived as racist by racists. Mm -hmm. But by non-racists, my comment would not have been perceived as racist because they would have understood that what I'm about is realizing the reality of racism in our society on the basis of an understanding that we have to understand where the weaknesses are so that we can fix it. I would never have said ordinarily that I know many other African people who are racist, but I'm afraid that Julius Malema's comments about Indian people drives me to that point where I say he is an absolute racist because his aim is not to create a non-racist society and our constitution obliges all of us to take the necessary steps to create a non-racial society. So do you think he could have said it in a different way, that the agenda is probably... He could have said it very differently very different to, to say we have racism everywhere. He should have said we have racism everywhere. I know African people who are racist. I know whites who are racist. I know Indian people who are racist. And we really have got to get, get together and resolve the problem. So I want to make the statement that I should have made initially, and Julius Malema should have made. Who we try to get on the show, by the way, because obviously we'd love to get his comments. That we should be, we should try and work towards working towards a non-racist society, and it starts with us. 
we must look deep into our hearts to see how racist and sexist we really are. It's not only about racism. It's also about sexism. It's also about our attitude to gay and lesbian people. It's also our religious problem because... What, what do you think gives us the right to be racist? What gives us the right to be sexist? Where does that stem Nothing from? Nothing does, but it stems from a human quality of people ordinarily thinking that they are better than the next person, but also it stems from an age-old thing which says that white is better. So if you look at the skin lighting cream market, it's huge. And the reason for that is that people begin to think that the lighter skin is better. The lighter skin white people, of course, try and get sunburned, which is a more difficult problem. But in the end, there is, there is this world disease almost, where people think that darker skinned people are not good. I mean, you, you, you have families who get very happy when their sons bring home a bride who is fair. That's how deep it is. And do you think, therefore, that fair-skinned people, white people, are complicit in this because often they don't say anything at all? Uh, not because they don't say anything. As it happens, white people are better off economically and in a whole range of other ways. And that deepens the problem. Okay, is that what this is all about? Does it boil down to, obviously you explained to us the differences in views when it comes to skin colour, but is the economic disparity the driving factor here? One of the no, main I factors? I think the economic disparity is one factor, but I think that there is a the deep-seated uh, racism among many people, which is another factor, because I, I, I find two things. People will talk non-racism, but when you sit around in people's homes, around their own dinner tables, white, Indian, African, everybody, the, Everybody's uh, doing the private conversations are kind of different. So it should stop at the home? It, it should, should stop start in at the space. home. Our conversion should start at the home. Our conversions to, should start within ourselves. Our conversion should start within our own hearts. And I tell you, it's not an, it's not an easy process to get rid of that kind of thing when you've been brought up within it. Zach, I'm going to ask you to stop there because we've got a call from Mopella from the Western Cape who wants to ask you a question. Go ahead, Mopella. <coughs> Please ask the question for Zach. Hello? Mopella, go Mopella. ahead. Yes, I can hear you. What's your question? No, my question, I wanted to second that man who's speaking there. Uh, uh, that there's still a, a racism in South Africa, especially in case that end with the Indians. Because I've been staying there in Newcastle, Lady Smith, Daniel's court. If you check there, our black people, we have been treated like anything else because sometimes. The Indians, you work for a month, when they are, you are about to get the salary, they will take old cloth agency so that they can take that money out. What I'm saying, what Malema once said was through reflection. So you will find that white people, they are more better than Indian. Indians, they are most, 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 most racism people in South Africa. Zach, okay. to respond to my, that. My, Thanks, my, ex fella. my experience is that there are white people who are better than Indian people. There are Indian people who are better than white people. I absolutely agree that the number of Indian people who treat their workers very badly. I know white people who treat their workers very badly. And I know African people who treat their African workers much worse than many Indian people do. And I know those people. I spoke to a number of, of African domestic workers the other day, and they confirmed to me in KwaZulu-Natal that as far as they are concerned, the white bosses are the best. The Indian people are like, okay, but the African bosses are the worst.
Zach, let me just ask you about xenophobia off the back of that. We have seen rise and fall of xenophobia. It's never gone away. Is that linked to economics? What's the driving force there? And this sort of conversation about race when you blame so-and-so for doing something, uh, does that just feed into xenophobia when you blame them for for using their power? I think, I, I think it does. It feeds into xenophobia. It feeds into the tribal trouble in South Africa too. Because the Kosas and Zulus, for example, in our country, each of them think that they are a cut above the other lot. And therefore, that's where the fighting comes. That's where the trouble comes. So, so the, the, the tribal differences in our country is one thing. Xenophobia is another. And xenophobia is quite complicated because economy is responsible for it to an extent. But it's also a trouble because I believe in the notion of a world actually without borders. I believe that people should be able to go wherever they want to go and do whatever they want to do. And I, 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 I believe in that song which all of us know, which is if only the world were one. Zach, My vision Zach, is for one world. Sorry, let's bring in Phil from Ennendale. Phil, go ahead. Oh, it's actually Theo from Annadale. Okay, Phil, sorry, please, go yeah, ahead. I just have a question for the gentleman over there. Earlier he mentioned, you know, like colors, but he didn't say colors, he said so-called colors. And we have such a big problem with that as colors, that people call us so-called colors because we are colors, because so-called colors sound already like racism. What does he have to say about that? No, I'm sorry if I offended you, but there are two trends, and I must admit, I still don't know what's the right way to do it. Because some people say you must call me colored, other people say don't call me colored, so I bet people in all sorts of different ways. My own thinking is, is that you go straight and say a colored person is a colored person, and that's because of my other thinking, where I don't like all these funny, funny words, like when people call me visually impaired or something, or, or, or somehow positively abled. I don't like all that. If you are blind, you're blind. If you're colored, you're colored. And that is my view. But because different people get upset at different terms, I don't know which one to use sometimes. Zach, do you think that racists use race to further their own agenda? We've seen it in the past, we've seen it historically, all around the world, haven't we? All around the world, yes. And, and, and they, they, they push their own agenda, but more importantly, it makes them feel good that they are better than other people. Human beings feel good because when they compare themselves with other people, they want to see themselves as better. And race is one way in which they see themselves as better. The rich people see themselves as better than poor people. The Muslims see themselves as better the, than the Christians and so on. I think there's a general tendency almost on the part of all human beings to find ways in which they feel that they are better than somebody else because that makes them feel good about themselves and that's the good kick which they need in life to make themselves happy. Right, we've got a caller, yeah, right. Sekhale from Rustenburg, who'd like to ask you something, Zach. Go ahead. Sekhale? Hi, 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 Jay. Hi, what would you like to ask Zach? Judge, the... Judge, the... the Julius, Julius Malema has has come has, has come under fire for expressing his views on racism and and I, I think many people in the in the white community in the Indian community and perhaps in the colored community are not happy with what he said but do you agree that he's actually correct the only difference is that he was not diplomatic about it but he was frank and open and perhaps brutal about it. Do you also agree that black people are the worst victims of racism in South Africa currently? Look at the mining industry. You will find shocking, shocking treatment of black people in this industry. Do you agree to these things? 
Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Sir Khaled. Okay, two questions. The first question is, I was brutal and honest and frank as well, but I was not racist. Julius Malema excuses everybody else. He's too frightened to call white people racist because I suppose white people help him in the tobacco industry or something. He's too frightened to call African people racist and he chooses a minority community and sits on them. That is the most cowardly racism I have come across. He must concede that there are African, white, and colored racists as well, and that racism is a deep problem in society. And I've challenged him to a debate, and I dare him to come along, because I want to talk to him about this face to face in an audience which he himself chooses. I dare him to come and talk to me openly on these issues. Secondly, I absolutely agree that poor black people like poor Indian people and poor people everywhere suffer a great deal in relation to the economy. There are poor Indian people too who work in all sorts of very difficult circumstances and colored and nowadays even white people who, who work as park, uh, parking attendants and so on and so on. So I absolutely agree that poor people suffer very seriously in minds and so on. But black people like Julius Malema who are rich, become oppressors themselves, they don't suffer at all. He has got more money than most Indian colored or white people, and therefore he becomes a rich oppressor in his own right. Ask him to declare his assets. I will declare mine, and I promise you he is worth 20 times as much as I am worth. Okay, Zach, and you two are welcome to have that debate with us here. Very good to talk to you, Zach Yacoub. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, don't forget to send us your tweets, because still ahead, we talk to the group Khatful Cape Tonians, who are, well, Khatful. Later, we take a look at the drastic steps one community took to improve their access to water. <laughs>